All right, well, welcome to another edition of Art Brunch, where we explore the wisdom of the arts, spirituality, and the great ideas. Our topic is immoral and moronic, the liberal and conservative mind. Now, this is going to be two parts. I just had way too much information. And I also wanted to give everybody a, a chance to be able to share their perspective on things. So uh, this is going to be part one of part two. If you don't get a chance to share today, I'll definitely try to give a lot of time for part two. It'll be a real give and take sort of presentation next week. So anyway, um, based on the title, I want to just make a quick confession up front. I don't believe that either liberals or conservatives possess the perspective that they do because they are immoral or stupid or both. Now, first, we need to be clear what we are talking about when we use these words, conservative and liberal. So I thought I'd start with the practical manifestations of being conservative or being liberal. Liberals prefer trying different kinds of foods. While conservatives prefer meat and potatoes. Liberals prefer free verse poetry, like this one by Sylvia Plath. I didn't want any flowers. I only wanted to lie with my hands turned up and be utterly empty. How free it is. You have no idea how free. The peacefulness is so big it dazes you, and it asks nothing, a name tag, a few trinkets. It is what the dead close on, finally. I imagine them shutting their mouths on it like a communion tablet. Conservatives prefer poetry that rhymes, like Wordsworth. I slumber, did my spirit seal. I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees. Rolled round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. Conservatives prefer objective landscape paintings, like this one by John Constable. And liberals are comfortable with all kinds of styles, including abstract work, like Jackson Pollock. Conservatives tend to have neat and tidy bedrooms. Whereas liberals, well, you get the picture here. And finally, conservatives prefer the comfort of home. Liberals tend to prefer the adventure of travel. Now, here are lists of some characteristics of liberals and conservatives that I called from the web where there is general consensus. We're going to start with the conservative traits that are pretty classic that most people agree on. Now, I want to point this out. These are tendencies. Most conservatives don't behave according to this list all of the time. And the same goes for liberals when we look at their classic traits. But let's go through them. Conservatives prefer order. They hate too much information, which is usually experienced as chaos. If a conservative senses confusion and messiness, they will immediately try to get rid of it. Conservatives seek to reduce complexity, so they like simplicity. Too much variety causes anxiety and stress in a conservative. They like sharp boundaries, clear-cut categories. This also reduces complexity. Conservatives love tradition because they are familiar and bring a sense of clarity and stability. Religion falls into this category. Spirituality uh, sometimes means religion to a conservative. Sometimes it means flaky mysticism. Change of any kind, straying for this status quo, straying from the status quo, the norm, is usually something the conservative wants to avoid. 
either or thinking. This is also typical of conservatives, black and white thinking. Personal responsibility is a big deal to conservatives. We should be judged based on outcomes we produce that we merit. Participation trophies drive conservatives nuts. They believe success should be rewarded and failure punished. And freedom. Conservatives preach freedom, but a particular kind of freedom. Freedom of opportunity. Freedom to pursue interests and realize a vocation. And finally, the most sacred entity in a society for the conservative is the individual. Not in terms of expressing one's unique individuality or personality, which is often a liberal trait, but in protecting personal freedom and constitutional rights. Now, here are the classic traits for liberals. Liberals like information, they're very open to the world. The more information, the better decisions that can be made. They typically prefer broader perspective versus zeroing in on details, which conservatives tend to do. Liberals like variety. It's the spice of life. Sameness is boring. Unlimitedness. Liberals have no problem getting rid of boundaries, which are experienced as inhibiting free expression. Liberals like novelty. They like whatever is new and different. Tradition is often experienced as stale and confining. Change, even for change's sake, is often seen as a good. Liberals tend to be both and sorts of people, not either or. Because truth is often enigmatic, it's ambigu ambiguous, and it often contains seeming opposites. That's because truth is situational, it's contextual, it's historically contingent, something liberals like to recognize. Affirmation. Liberals want everyone to feel valued and worthy. Participation trophies were the idea of liberals for this reason. Equality is something liberals champion, usually as equality of outcome. They don't want people left out. The pie should be split up as fairly as possible so that the greatest number benefit. And finally, liberals stress community over the individual. If someone's personal rights cause harm to the broader community, such rights should be restricted for liberals. Now for your viewing pleasure, here are the various traits side by side. Before we move on, I want to say a word about this freedom versus equality that might have stuck out for some of you. Because liberals will say they are for freedom, but usually in the sense of freedom of expression. But conservatives see freedom in a, in a more classic sense. Historian Will Durant, some of you may have heard of him, Will Durant, said freedom and equality are sworn enemies. Liberals, being both and, want to retain both freedom and equality. But listen to the full statement from Durant. He really says that's impossible. Nature smiles at the union of freedom and equality in our utopias. For freedom and equality are sworn and everlasting enemies. And when one prevails, the other dies. Give you a second to digest that. What did Will Durant mean? Well, in a society such as ours, a democratic and free market driven society, the freedom to pursue various goals will naturally result in inequality as far as rewards and status and outcome. For example, our culture values entertainment and business above almost every other vocational pursuit. So those who entertain us, like actors and athletes, will be paid far more and receive much greater status than most others. And because we are a consumer-driven society, 
Those who offer the most desired products and services in the most efficient manner will receive the greatest compensation and status. Sorry, school teachers. Sorry, social workers. Sorry, 99% of artists. Now on to the reasons we are liberal and conservative. Right off the bat, it would seem our upbringing has a lot to do with our political affiliation. It does. In fact, it has a 69% predictability rate. That's pretty darn high. It's been well studied and documented that we do not reason our way to most of our worldviews, including our political views. We inherited much of our views and simply look for justification of what we already believe. Well, now let's look at the brain science to see what it has to say. The following information is from studies at the Weill Medical College of Cornell University, but other research institutions have discovered similar information and drawn the same conclusions. Here they are. Liberals tend to have a larger anterior cingulate gyrus. That may be the very first time you've ever heard of that. It's in the brain. Larger anterior, anterior cingulate gyrus. This is an area responsible for taking in new information, new information, and using it to make choices. Liberals tend to respond to new information and situations with curiosity and a desire to understand. Now that seems like a good thing. Unfortunately, in cases of real danger, this can mean hesitation due to too much curiosity and overanalysis. In contrast, conservatives have a larger right amygdala, which controls the flight or fight response. As a result, conservatives favor stability and loyalty and tradition which all reduce anxiety. Conservatives often respond to new information with fear. Reducing anxiety is a good thing to the conservative. Unfortunately, this could mean an unwillingness to change and adapt to new situations. I'll give you an example from my own uh, life regarding uh, this situation, these parts of the brain. A oh, long time ago, when I was in school in Richmond, Virginia, I was in a coffee shop with my fiance. And suddenly, while we're sitting there having coffee, having conversation, a man runs through the front door. He has pantyhose over his head and he's waving a gun. And he tells everybody to get out. And he runs up to the staff at the counter and tells them to go to the back of the kitchen. And then he disappears into the back of the kitchen with the staff. Instead of running out like everybody else, I'm straining my neck to try to get a good look of what's happening in the back of the restaurant. I must have a large anterior cingulate gyrus. <laughs> now, fortunately, my fiance must have had a large right amygdala because she said, honey, I think we ought to get out of here. But even once we were out of the cafe shop and across the street, I was still straining to try to see something through the front glass of the coffee shop. Some might call me stupid. I'd like to say I was curious, tomato, tomato. Well, recall the 69% predictability rate based on our upbringing. There is a 71.6% predictability of our political affiliation or per political perspective based on brain structure according to Dr. Gail Saltz, who is an associate professor of psychiatry at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, which was part of the Wheel Cornell School study. So this approximate 70-30 predictability, it means we can't be black and white on this, a very conservative perspective, by the way, black and white. <laughs> now these studies though show tendencies, likelihoods, but what that means is that 30% of people, 30% with a large right amygdala 
or whose parents were conservative, well, they might be liberal politically for other complex reasons. Now, I also looked at criticisms of these studies, and invariably the criticisms were that the 30% exceptions disprove the rule. Not to me. For me, the 30% exceptions actually strengthen the general argument for the truth of these conclusions. So if we accept the general conclusions of the studies, what does this mean in practical terms? It means that two people with different brain structures, as just described, will hear the same information, but interpret it, and thus respond to it differently. For example, a new family from Pakistan has moved into the neighborhood. One person might respond, oh, how interesting. I'd like to get to know more about them. I wonder what they are like. Why did they move here? Obviously, openness, variety, and novelty are valued in such a person. But another person may see the family as introducing a complexity into what is familiar, and they may react with fear instead and ask, is this family going to change the familiar dynamics of this neighborhood? Are they so different I won't understand them? Are they safe to get to know? Such a person will prefer a neighborhood like one they are familiar with, maybe even one like the one they grew up with. They also may try to understand the Pakistani family by fitting them into a category they may have created based on everything they've learned about Pakistani people and culture, particularly what they've heard on the news. Sharp categories like this reduce complexity and thus relieve anxiety in such a person. Let's look at another example. Think about the issue of guns. Now, liberals make the mistake of trying to reason with conservatives on gun control by pointing to scientific studies, an area which brings in new information, which liberals are comfortable with. But if a person has an active fear mechanism in the brain, lots of new information may simply produce confusion and hence anxiety. The right to possess a gun is going to allay anxiety, fears, regardless of what studies show about gun ownership and gun violence. So if liberals don't speak to the fear aspect and the safety issue when speaking to conservatives, they won't be heard, literally will not be heard. Now on to more brain science. This book by Ian McGilchrist came out in 2009. It is about the function of the two hemispheres of the brain. The book catapulted the author to prominence. And it's now a modern classic in neuroscience, and it made the author a go-to expert on the subject of how the two hemispheres of the brain work. McGilchrist is an English polymath. He studied medicine, but moved to psychiatry. He is a literary scholar and also a philosopher. McGilchrist is a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and he's three times Three times he's been elected a fellow of All Souls College, Oxford University. You could say he's widely read and rather intelligent, and he offers about as broad a perspective on how the brain works as you can imagine. So I'd like to introduce his ideas. First off, with a little exercise. Imagine that you took your family on a hike in the woods. Here are two different scenarios. You and your family get lost and you can't find your way back to the path. It's now been three days and you and your family more than anything are really weak and hungry, hungry, very hungry. Which of these images will grab your attention the most under those circumstances? Now another scenario, say instead of being hungry, you just heard a sound behind you. You look and see a moose, and then you notice near you is a calf, the obvious offspring 
of Mama Moose. Now, which of these perspectives, these images, will dominate your attention the most? In the first scenario, my guess is you would focus on the fish as a potential meal. And in the second scenario, you're going to survey the landscape to see what is the best way to escape the danger of the situation. In the first scenario, the left hemisphere of your brain has been activated. And in the second, the right hemisphere has been activated. Let's look at another image. Again, you are in the woods and you're rather tired from hiking. Your backpack feels very heavy, stuffed with days of rations. You sit down to rest and you see this, a wild horse. What are your thoughts? Do you begin to wonder how difficult it would be to break the horse? Because you see, it is a means of transportation. Or if not transportation for you, perhaps it would be able to carry your heavy backpack. Or are you someone who just wants to sit and admire the beauty of the horse? Observe its movements out of fascination. If you saw the horse's potential as a means of transportation, you were using your left hemisphere. And if you were simply admiring the horse and wondering about the meaning of its behavior, you were using your right hemisphere. In his book, Ian McGilchrist discusses that such traits are rooted in the differences between the brain hemispheres. Now the left brain, right brain distinctions have been criticized as a kind of pop psychology level of understanding of what are obviously very complex processes. And when he wrote his first book, McGilchrist thought he had addressed these criticisms, but he still heard about them later, so he wrote a second book, one which took a decade to write. In fact, he wrote so much on it that it ended up being two volumes, a two-volume follow-up to The Mastery and His Emissary, titled The Matter with Things. And in The Matter with Things, he writes, quote, just about everything that is said about the hemispheres in pop psychology is wrong because it rests on beliefs about what the hemispheres do, not about how they approach it. So McGilchrist at length argues in his new book that both hemispheres are involved in more or less everything, but the main differences, and listen to this, the main differences in the hemispheres is how each side attends to the environment how it pays attention to the environment. The research shows that the less hemisphere is less aware of its surroundings and tends to ignore what is irrelevant to its purpose. It focuses on useful details. It sees clearly, but it sees little. It is inclined to either or thinking. It enables us to manipulate the world. It's looking for tools in the world. It is more certain and confident, even when it gets things wrong. It reacts faster than the right side, and so it favors action. Because it struggles with complexity, it is more prone to the emotions of fear and anger. These traits we normally associate with a conservative perspective. By contrast, the right hemisphere is better at understanding the world in all of its complexity. It is inclined to both and thinking, and it's more willing to change its view in the light of new evidence. It is more comfortable with uncertainty, it is more reflective and empathic than the left hemisphere. Instead of anger or fear, because the right hemisphere is empathic, it is more prone to depressive moods. It literally feels the pain of others, including that of animals. 
These traits we associate with a liberal perspective. The left hemisphere prefers the map to the territory. How do I get from here to there? The right prefers the territory, or is it's more present to the world. Ah, let's take in the scenery. The left sees the parts, whereas the right sees the whole. The left explains, the right understands. The left apprehends, the right comprehends. So naturally, the left brain is often associated with conservatives and the right often associated with liberals. Now let's again remember these are tendencies. I think the 70-30 rule also applies to brain hemispheres. Left brain dominant people only tend toward a conservative perspective and vice versa, but other factors may be at play. Now to wrap up, I want to go through again the traits of each political perspective that we started with. And this time I want us to focus on the potential shadow side of each trait, the negative side of each trait. Considering both McGilchrist's information and all the other information about conservative and liberal perspectives, let's go down the list again and think about the shadow side. Conservatives like order. Well, too much order produces staleness and stagnation, which often provokes, especially in youth, a natural impulse to rebel. They prefer simplicity, which means that they might not fully understand a situation or a person. Conservatives like sharp boundaries and categories, which could lead to overgeneralization of people and result in racism and bigotry of all kinds. Conservatives prefer tradition, which means they could be unwilling to change as circumstances change. Conservatives tend to be either or thinkers, which means they won't appreciate the complexity or fullness of situation or a person. They might become less accepting of others as a result. Conservatives favor responsibility. However, this may result in leaving those who are unsuccessful or maladapted to our society behind. It can often come across as uncaring. Conservatives value a particular kind of freedom, the freedom to do what it takes to feel safe, to maintain stability and to produce order, but mainly the freedom to pursue one's interests and vocational goals. But what this may result in is a lack of concern for the impact on the wider community. And it might often result in unequal access to resources among a large part of the population. And finally, conservatives value the individual. Again, the concerns of the wider society might be ignored Interestingly, corporations under law are now treated as individuals, which I think encourages, as we've all seen, profits over people, a sort of profits over people mentality. That's the darker side. Now let's look at liberal traits and the shadow side of these. Liberals tend to be very open which means that they are prone to being careless and naive and accepting ideas and people. They prefer variety, but that also means they might invite in so much variety that it could destabilize a community. They like unboundedness, unlimitedness, which could result in their inability to distinguish threats in their environment. They like novelty, which means they devalue tradition. They kind of throw away the baby with the bathwater when it comes to moral traditions, which are very necessary for the stability of society. They have a both and sort of perspective, 
which means too much complexity can prevent the ability to act decisively and productively with the information at hand. In other words, they're prone to analysis by paralysis. No, paralysis by analysis, excuse me. They're prone to that. They're very affirming, which means that they might fail to create a proper motive in a person to improve. I mean, after all, if you get a trophy for doing nothing, why try? Liberals value equality, which means that they may pressure the underrepresented minority to pursue paths that they're actually not that interested in or skilled at might result in undervaluing merit in attaining positions. And finally, liberals favor community over the individual, but that fails to recognize that history advances perhaps predominantly through the actions of individuals. And perhaps we, the weakest members of society could possibly hold back the strongest. Now for part two, which we'll get to next week, we will discuss more of the moral implications, the moral implications of Miguel Chris's ideas. If you want to argue with him or go more deeply, I can encourage you to Google him this week and watch some of the many interviews of him on YouTube where he explains his ideas and uh, counters criticisms. So I'll give you a moment to take down his name so you can Google him later. And also next week, we will look at the ideas of this man, Jonathan Haidt, about the politics of left and right. Haidt is the Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership at the New York University Stern School of Business. He was actually teaching at my alma mater, the University of Virginia, when this book was published. But he made the bewildering decision to go north. Not sure why he did that. Foolish in my eyes, but I guess he thinks he knows what's best for him. In closing, we need to remember that our brains developed also when we were young. Hence, our upbringing determined to a significant degree the shape of our brain. But we also must remember that we can alter our brains, makeup, through intentional practice or significant life experiences. The brain, as we've now learned, is plastic and can change. So I'll finish just to lay my cards out on the table, uh, tell you my own journey of brain development. When I was a teenager and in my early 20s, I was very left-brained, uh, liked sharp categories, found security and stability in tradition, particularly my religion. And life was very simple and clear and ordered for me. And that helped me. It brought stability. It brought direction to my life. I didn't get into a lot of trouble. In fact, many uh, liberal sociologists have commented that it's actually pretty healthy to bring up a child in a conservative home because it does bring stability, order, and structure to the child, which is so necessary for its development. Now, I'm also a very curious person. I'm a seeker, and I think by pursuing uh, philosophy and theology and various experiences, I altered the shape and structure of my brain so that I became more right-brained as an adult. As you know, I love the arts, and arts are typically associated with liberal perspectives. That's not always true, however, but typically it is. I enjoy novelty. I enjoy uh, anything that's new. I enjoy adventure, so I love travel. I love new ideas. So I tend towards uh, a liberal perspective. However, I recognize, come to recognize, I should say, the value of the conservative perspective and the weaknesses in my own uh, slightly liberal perspective. 
So having confessed that to you, now I want to open the floor for your comments, perhaps confessions, <laughs> and uh, just hear your response to the information you've received and um, anything else that you want to ask or comment on. <laughs> 